Are you struggling with maintaining and scaling your shiny apps as they grow in complexity? If so, then this talk is for you. Juan Cruz is a seasoned shiny and plumber developer who will share his experience of turning a monolithic shiny app into microservices based structure via backend API components with a focus on imp improving, maintaining and scalability. Juan will discuss how to break an app into smaller pieces with individual components to improve the overall efficiency and flexibility. Additionally, he'll share the benefits of creating a public API for the app and reducing the resource demands through microservices architecture. With the introduction of Shiny for Python, I believe the public API structure that Juan introduces would also be used for Python-based Shiny apps. As someone with over 10 years of experience with R and passion for open source contributions, Juan is uniquely equ equipped to offer practical tips and insights for someone looking to make similar transition. Uh, Juan is a data engineer or shiny developer and uh, at ha Happy Cabbage, Cabbage uh, Analytics and his experience uh, was turning in ideas into reality by creating successful MVPs from production grade shiny applications. So I'm so happy to introduce Juan. Hi everyone, thanks Beta for your introduction. So uh, can you see well? Yeah, we can hear you. So uh, whenever we're ready, uh, can you see my slides still? Yes. Perfect. Uh, hi everyone, I am Juan Cruz. I work at Happy Cabbage Analytics. And I'm, I'm going to talk about how we turn our monolithic shiny apps into microservices based structure. But first, I would like to cite readers uh, at ShinyConf 2023. Yes, I know this was two days ago. Shiny is taught as a monolith. But why shouldn't it? What are the benefits of having a microservices-based structure? Well, the most commonly found explanations in the literature are related to scalability, man maintenance, fault isolation, etc. So in this talk, I will present some or sort of walkthrough of how we build or currently build apps with microservices-based structures. Or, or at least I will or at least which focuses on the idea of microservices, because throughout this talk, you will know that this is a step-by-step -step process in which probably you will find out that uh, what best fits for your app is some step in the middle and not the complete scenario. Let's get it started. As I mentioned, I work at Happy Cabbage. Happy Cabbage goal is to help cannabis dispensaries in their business and for that, we currently have four tools, Downstore for inventory management, Sirius to check store's performance, Polaris for marketing, and Claire to help bad tenders. Bad tenders are the persons that assist you when you order cannabis. For this talk, I will use Claire as an example. So this, what you see here is one portion of Claire. Claire let bartenders know their customers and helps them in recommending the key products they would like. Claire consists on different boxes that contain specific information about the selected customer. So for instance, here we can see a fast facts section, product preferences, product recommendations, and among other boxes we have there. At Happy Coach Analytics, as the dev team, this is what we receive from the research team, a working and validated minimum viable product, MVP. So at this point, the idea was to validate that the MVP has value for the dispensaries. So the app works, but it has, hasn't got any great engineering concepts in it. So commonly, the code is how a typical example Shiny app looks a huge R file with Chinese UI and server definitions, a single file that takes care of everything. UI definition, data access, calculations, transformations, and UI rendering. 
everything in just one app file. So what are the main drawbacks of this approach? Well, as all the code is in one single file, as we are a team, if multiple developers are working on the same file, it is highly possible that we create merge conflicts. It's complex to follow the logic, as the code might be mixed throughout different lines. And finally, this is some, something specific to Claire. When we released the app, multiple customers wondered if they could include the product recommendations into their own e-commerce websites. So we thought, sure, it's just by creating a Plumber API and letting them get the data we are showing. Uh, however, as the data access and calculation were done in the Shiny App code, we had to copy paste all of this code into the Plumber API. So the main issue here is that if we change the code in one place, we must change the same code in the other code. So this increases the probability of introducing incompatibility issues. And of course, developers tend to forget copy pasting stuff. In order to start facing all of these drawbacks, we apply modularization techniques. For modularization, we tend to follow Epsilon's Rhino's concept, not necessarily by using the package, but using the folder's structure by means of the box R package. For the ones who don't know about the box package, uh, I would uh, suggest taking a look, look at it. It's, it's amazing what you can do there for modularization techniques. Well, the key when modularizing is to split the app into different concepts. As we mentioned before, Clear consists on different boxes that contain specific information, say different modules. And probably this is the most challenging part when modularizing, being able to take splits of an app. There are no steps to follow on this. It is mostly a craft task in which one gets better over experience and time. As you can see, several talks of this Shiny conference were about this, so I recommend taking a look at all of the talks. Thus, we split each UI box into a specific module, which will contain that module's UI and logic. So now, instead of just an app R file, we refactor and move code into module-specific files. So now the main app R file now just calls the module's UIs and server functions, and that's it. It's extremely easy to read and to follow. Each module, for instance, here the fast facts module, contains just its UI definition, data access, transformations, and UI rendering functions. However, these can still be a complex module, hard to follow and debug, right? So we can still keep modularizing, or better said, simplifying this code. This is done by detecting in the module's code some subtasks and moving them into new files that contain just these subtask functions. For instance, in this example, uh, the case of a function that takes care of getting and transforming the data that should be shown, shown for the customer fast facts box. In this scenario, the module just takes care of getting the data by calling the new function and showing it in the UI components. Sorry, the, the data that shows in this UI components and rendering. No querying or calculations in the module code. So, uh, sorry, as you can see, the, the, the module's code tend to, to be more easily readable. The subtasks functions are in charge of getting and transforming the data and just returning the values that are going to be shown in the UI. Exactly what we show in the UI is expected to be obtained by calling these get functions. So this would be the actual app structure. Of course, I'm not mentioning about the rest of the get helper functions of the rest of the modules. So by just moving all of these subtask functions into a newer package, Shiny is no longer in charge of data access and transformations, and Shiny is only in charge of obtaining the data to show and rendering it into the UI. Moreover, we gain all of the benefits that are provided to 
packages, like unit tests, checks, etc. Everything what we know about packages. Then for our shiny code, uh, our shiny module, the only needed required change is to replace where these getter functions come from, switching from the local files to the backend package. So now, if this is the current structure of our shiny app with the shiny package and the backend, sorry, with the shiny code project and the shiny apps backend package, to build a plan right, it is as easy as creating a new project for it. And just for each backend function, build an API endpoint. Really, we just need to call the backend function, and that's it. What we show in the Shiny app is accessible through the Plumber API. So as a summary, what we have is a backend or package, which is in charge of all data access and transformations, and returns just the information that we will be shown in our Shiny app. We have a Shiny app that is just in charge of pulling the show data and rendering it into the UI. And the Plumber API that allows programma programmatically user access to our app state. In this case, in this way, we decrease the probability of merge conflicts as each module and function is as specific and self-contained as possible. Each function has short and connected portions of code. And we have no more copy-paste tentative issues. If we want to change some showing value in the Shiny app, that exact same change will be faced through the API, as this change is done only in the button package. At this point, uh, in my experience, this is the best app configuration that I can recommend. But are there microservices running on a server? Why do we want or need to have microservices? At Happy Coverage Analytics, we deploy our apps and APIs to POSIT Connect. So to scale them, we just need to move sliders or a numeric input in this case. However, for one helper app we have, a public helper app, we discovered this error exists. We've never seen this error before and there's really few documentation about it. It says that there cannot be over 20 concurrent users of the Shiny app. As all of the UI facing elements were already included in our API, we decided that at this, as this was quite a simple app, the best alternative was to migrate the Shiny app with an HTML plus JavaScript based website. I am not an HTML or JavaScript expert, but trust me that with few knowledge, having our working API, it was really easy to migrate the app into, uh, the app into our website. And in this way, we got this particular app to run completely out of Shine using our microservices based structure through Plumber. Well, as I said, this approach needs some knowledge of HTML and JavaScript but it gets rid of the Shiny architecture and the Shiny daemon cont continuously running on a server. And the alternative here, sorry, an alternative that we could approach here is using a microservices structure that Shiny will query through the HTTR package. So here, instead of migrating Shiny to uh, an HTML site, we could still use Shiny querying the, the API, the microservices API, but Really, I couldn't find any benefits of this approach, so I will be really glad if any one of you could point them out. So as a takeaway section, I would like to mention these steps. First, we need to split the, con the app into concepts, modularize the app so each concept builds a module, detect data access and calculation code chunks, move these chunks into functions, move these functions into a new R backend package. If needed, if we want, create a Plumber API for each of the backend functions, or at least for the ones we want to expose to the public. And finally, if we really need to use this microservices structure, we could migrate the Shiny app into a website that queries the API. Something really important when uh, exposing Plumber APIs is that we must take care of authentication and the backend microservice on the back, back, sorry, 
on the Button Microservices API. So that's everything from my side. So we can go to the questions thing section. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a very introduction, uh, for a great introduction to breaking down big shiny apps. Uh, can you talk about uh, what motivated you to break down a big shiny app? Because generally, that's not something people would do. So was there a strong motivation for you to do this? Well, um, the main motivation on modularizing our shiny apps is because of merge conflicts. If I want to, to say the truth, we are a, a team of developers. And if you have a huge R file and you have to, to edit some portions of the code, you will get always merge conflicts. So if you don't want merge conflicts and have just one file, you have to dedicate one developer to just one task in the app. That's the, the main motivation. And truly, once you see one modularized app, you, you, can, you can check that the concepts really get well nested and you go, can go following the concepts. The, for me, the, the only uh, difficulty when starting with modules is knowing how to, to work with reactive elements and how you can pass those reactives throughout modules. But once you dominate it, it trust me, it's, it's the best you could do. OK. Uh, how how uh, costly is it to maintain and upgrade uh, this kind of architecture in terms of time, uh, time of developers and money, uh, deployment cost, and effort? Well, throughout my, my talk, uh, a, a large portion of it was about modularizing the code. So um, that really depends on on the app how complex it is, but yeah, we, we've seen a lot of, of talks talking about it. So I think that that shouldn't be part of the of the monolithic uh, changes. But once you have the the shiny app modularized, in order to turn it into a Plumber API and and putting it into a microservice uh, server, it's no more than two hours because it's it's just uh, well, of course, this is if, if, if you are working with Posit Connect. If you are working with AWS or something like that, it's, again, just building a Docker file. And really, it's pretty simple translating Lambda APIs into, into microservices. Awesome. And uh, we have a question from Pedro. Uh, did you ever run into a situation where different APIs had to scale at different speeds? Uh, did you have to use different servers for each API? Thanks Pedro, for your question. So there are situations uh, in, in which you have like an app in which calculations take really long. And then the people, the users, the app users will just use the app to explore that long uh, uh, timing calculations. So in those cases, as you have a long uh, calculation task, that's the scenario in which the microservices work because, for instance, you can have one Plumber API that has, uh, say, 30 threads running, and your Shiny app can have just three or four uh, threads running, and that would be a good scenario. On our case, um, we, we, we tend to, to make our data access and calculations uh, small, very specific, so the queries are short. So we don't tend to to have that difference in threads, thread numbers between the two apps. And for authentication and that stuff, well, we at Happy Garbage we don't have to secure the uh, the APIs because yeah, again we are using Posit Connect and fortunately it takes care of all the authentication. And and yeah, our, our API queries are. Are done in, in the backend, so no, no need of making them public. In this, in the case of the app I talk about, that we had to move it to a HTML website. That's absolutely a public uh, website. So what we were showing in the public web website is exactly the same that was shown in the in the in the API. So we have we didn't have any issue according to security. 
the only thing to look there is you, you have some uh, security configurations in your Plumber API that, for instance, you select which IPs can access your API and that stuff. But yeah, sorry, no great uh, security things we, we have to build there. Apart from security uh, upgrades that you get when using Plumber uh, APIs, uh, are there any scaling advantages that you get when breaking down uh, a particular module into Plumber API? Yeah, yeah. So it's because for scaling just one API endpoint, you you, you have to scale it using a, a slider input. It, it's just a for the ones who don't know, Shiny and also Plumber are single threads. So if you are running just one Plumber API, there is only one thread that can take care of, of, of calculations. So for instance, if you have the API endpoint that takes long, then the next user of the API will have to wait until the, all of the previous queries are, are ended. So this is the case in which you have to take a look of how many concurrent users you are having and just scaling up your your application but again moving a slider this is the same as happens in aws or google cloud platform you to scale it it's just moving sliders uh, do you have any tools or methods to measure this performance yeah not me but uh, all of the cloud platforms have uh, tools for monitoring uh, app access so yeah, I, I don't. I, I cannot show it now because it's uh, our okay. enterprise account. But you will always see in in AWS, in Google Cloud Platform, in POSIT, all of them have uh, metrics about app usage, so you can see how many concurrent users you are having to each of your endpoints. Okay, and uh, Olga wanted to know: uh, Are you suggesting to extract functions into packages in general? or uh, in some situation? No, what I would suggest is having just one shiny project, one backend package, just one, that you will have all of the functions needed for the shiny app and the Plumber API. And if you need to extend particularly just one endpoint of, of this API, you can create one package, one, one Plumber API project for each of the of the endpoints, so in that case you can you can just scale whichever of these uh, plumber endpoints you you need. Awesome! Thank you so much for an uh, informative talk. I hope everyone sees the benefits of doing such uh, architecture changes. And uh, yeah, uh, see you next year. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much, Veda. Thank you, everyone. See you.